Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you. And as I said to you, feel free to have your tea and coffee and all of that throughout the whole talk. Um, we're delighted to have Dr. Pauline Gibbons with us from the University of New South Wales. And you, many of us are familiar with her work in the area of scaffolding language and a high challenge, high support approach to teaching. And I think what she's going to talk about today is going to be really useful for you in terms of thinking about teaching math and science through the medium of English. So you're teaching content through language. Or, and, and, no. Um, and we're really happy to have the teachers from Hamlin Midzayat here as well, so that you know, it, ho hopefully you might get a chance to have a chat with each other afterwards as well, and because um, because the students will be coming from Hamden Inside for your micro teaching assignment as well. And actually, we're going there tomorrow, so there's a lot of nice coincidences happening. That's where we're going tomorrow. Yes, that, that's where we're going tomorrow. It's very good as well. So thanks so much, Dr. Pauline. Um, okay, thank you. Well, as you can see, I'm going to be talking about scaffolding. Um, I've, I've, I've become known as a scaffolding lady. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> what that means, but anyway, that's going to be my, my topic. But I also want to talk about using, uh, thinking about language across the curriculum, so that you're, I think, you're, I think you're a science, 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 science and maths. Science and maths. Thinking about language in science and maths, for example. And I do have um, an example of a science lesson um, with uh, students who don't speak English or don't speak very much English in Australia um, and I'm going to show you some of the things that the teachers did and I've also got recordings of what some of the children said because I think that would be useful um, for people like yourself. So I'm going to start off though with, with <coughs> looking at the notion of scaffolding and what it means. It's become a term very much associated with teaching, especially in Australia, it's a big buzzword, it's a big word. Um, but I, in fact, the scaffolding describes something that happens in all cultures and in all families. So what I'm going to show you, first of all, are three photographs. And they're photographs of a father teaching his son to ride a bike. And I'm showing them to you because they are a very good ex um, ex example of scaffolding in an everyday context. And then we'll look at scaffolding language and what that means. Uh, and then we'll look at a classroom example. So that's, that's what I'm, we're going to be doing. So here is the first of my photographs. This is the first time this little boy <coughs> had been on a bike. And as you can see, the father is holding on to him so that, am I in the way? No. Nope. His father is holding on to him so he can't fall. So in other words, the father is doing a lot of work scaffolding. with the bike. He's scaffolding. He's hanging on to the child so the child feels safe and the child does as much as he can. So he's really sitting on the bike, pedaling, but the father's doing most of the work. Yeah. In the second one, He's got a bit better. This was a few days later. And he's, he's starting to ride by himself, but the father still has a hand on him. So that if he falls, he's not going to hurt himself. The father's going to catch him. And this is the third one where he's riding by himself. Now, that's a very simple model of scaffolding. But scaffolding is help that you give to a learner until they can do that bit by themselves and then you help them and then you still keep a, a hand on them metaphorically speaking until they're able to do it by themselves so it's really not a particularly difficult concept and it's something that we see all the time in very many contexts and language of course children don't just learn language people scaffold it for them. So you talk to young children, you listen to what they're saying, you might say it in another way. And this is the next example I want to show you. The next example is a conversation between a mother and a father and a child. The child was very young, he was about two and a half. But he was a very clever child and he had very good language. And and what had happened was that the parents had taken him to the zoo uh, the day before. And there was a special part of the zoo that was for children, 
where they could touch the animals. And so they took him to the children's section of the zoo, and he was holding, he had a drink, and he was still holding the plastic lid from the drink bottle. And there was a goat there, and, and he was stroking the goat, and while he was stroking the goat, the goat tried to eat the lid, as goats do. Yeah. And so the keeper came up and said very kindly to him, you mustn't eat the lid because it's not good for him. So a little incident happened, okay? The next day, the child remembered it and started talking about it. Now those of you who've got young children know that often they'll start a conversation with you and it may be something that happened earlier and they've just remembered it. So I'm going to show you this conversation and then we'll talk about why it's a good example of what scaffolding is. N is the child, his name was Nigel, and then F and N for mother and father. Nigel says, try eat lid. The father said, what tried to eat the lid? He doesn't immediately answer. Try eat lid. The father says, what tried to eat the lid? What tried to eat the lid? So he wants to know who it was or what it was. Goat. Man said, no. Goat tried to eat lid. Man said no. They could tell that's a child's language, right? And then he went the next day to his mother. And he said this again. Goat try eat lid. Man said no. Mother says, why did the goat say no? Why did the man say no? The why question's harder. Goat shouldn't eat lid. Good for it. So he hasn't learned to say it's not good for it. So he uses the shaking of the head, good for it. The goat shouldn't eat the lid. It's not good for it, says the mother. Goat try to eat lid. Man said no. Goat shouldn't eat lid. Good for it. Now look at the difference between what he started with, try to eat lid, and what he ends up with. The big difference in that try to eat lid of the first time he says it and what it says here. And the reason that it's expanded, it's got more, more information in it, is because of what the parents did. But the parents didn't actually correct him. They didn't say, no, that's not how you say it. They didn't do that. They engaged him in a conversation. So the what question, first of all, and then the why question that the mother asked. Now notice he hasn't learned all of it because the mother says, um, the goat shouldn't eat the lid, it's not good for it. She models the correct way to say it, but he doesn't actually say it. He doesn't actually, he doesn't actually say that it's not good for it. And that's what happens with scaffolding. You need more than one attempt very often. You don't get it right completely. But scaffolding should always support students when they actually most need it. Um, and that's at that point. So if I were to ask you, whose words are these? Are they the boys, little boy, or are they the parents? The parents and, and the child. Exactly. They're both the parents and the child, because this is a joint conversation. And the, the really important part about scaffolding is that you're not expecting the learner to do it all by themselves straight away. Just like those examples earlier with the photographs I showed you of the, um, of the little boy learning to ride a bike. You don't get it all at once, but it should always take you to the next step. So, does anyone want to make any comments about this? Can you see echoes of what you might do with, if you've got children, with your own children, or what you've seen, how, how, how people talk to children? Yes, I think it's important to make a conversation with the, your child. Some parents may, may, uh, might say, oh, yeah, you are right, you are a good boy, and that's it. Yeah, that's right. So sometimes there's no scaffolding. Yeah. So you've got to have a high expectation of a learner, whether it's a child or an adult. You need a high expectation. They might not quite reach that yet, 
but they'll go part way towards it. So that's the essence of scaffolding. It's, it's, you don't scaffold every person in exactly the same way because they're, they're, at, different, uh, they're at different stages. You have to encourage them, your children. Sorry, say again. You have to encourage them, do not frustrate them. Yes. When they want to learn. Yes. At the beginning. Yes, exactly. Um, you've got to encourage them, and of course the parents are. They're not saying good boy, but they are listening and taking him seriously. So that's kind of uh, uh, support, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Any other comments? I think it's also correct and direct correct the child and direct way. Yeah, they're collect, co 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 correcting the child, but indirectly. Yeah, they're not saying, no, that's not right, but they're, they're joining in with the conversation. So we say that those, that kind, this kind of um, scaffolding, it's, it's co-constructed. I mean, it's constructed between the learner and the teacher. They're doing it, or parents in this case. It's not one person doing all the work. All right, let's move on then to look at um, a more um, academic way of expressing what scaffolding is. But remember, it's all over us. It's all around every culture, in every language. <coughs> First of all, it is temporary help. Because you can go on scaffolding for too long yeah. and the child just thinks, well, you know, the teacher's going to do it for me. So you can you have to know when to stop it. So it's temporary help, and it assists a learner to move towards new concepts, new ideas, levels of understanding, and new language. And of course, and towards riding a bike, as you saw in those first few photographs I showed you. So it's temporary help. It enables a learner to know how to do something so that the learner will be better able to complete a similar task alone. So you're not just helping them in that instance, you're helping them to do similar things in the future by themselves. And the third, it's future oriented. Um, if you're familiar with the work of Vygotsky, um, this is translated, he wrote in Russian of course, what a learner can do with help today, he or she will be able to do alone tomorrow. I think that should be up in every classroom, in every classroom. It's what a learner can do today, he or she will be able to do uh, tomorrow. Um, however, scaffolding is not just help. Scaffolding is not just help. It's a particular kind of help. Sorry? It's guiding and Okay. Both of them guiding and helping. It's guiding and helping, exactly. And one of the points about scaffolding is that it helps a learner not only in that one time, but in the future. So if you, a, a child said to you, how do you spell the word cat? Okay. You could say C-A-T. Yeah. And that's help. That's fine. Or you could write it on the board, or you could say, look, you can see the word up there. All of those things are ways of helping. And sometimes that's a good thing to do, you just need a quick answer. But it's not scaffolding. Scaffolding would be if the teacher said something like this. Um, cat, how many sounds can you hear? At three. How do you think you might write the first of those sounds? I could be right. You help them to do that. They'll probably have an answer. What about the last sound? How might we write that? What about that sound in the middle? Ah. How could we write that? Now that is scaffolding because you're showing the child not only how to write the word cat, but they have a strategy for thinking about other words like dog and all the other words they might want to write. So scaffolding is more than just help. It is help that shows people how to solve a similar problem at another time. So it's, it's therefore to do with tomorrow, not just to do with today. Does anybody want to ask any questions? Can I just yes. make a comment about the previous slide, and it was just something that stuck in my mind, is when you look at the previous slide, 
of the four things that the parents said, three of them are questions, and of the demonstration you've just done when you were doing the scaffolding, most of what you were asking was questions. Yes, I hadn't thought of it like that, but you're quite right. But you're prompting the students to, I and mean, then they're fairly sure that the students know the answer, and if they can't, they can help them. But I think the most important thing is that it's, it's future oriented, so you're not just, it's not help here and now only. It's, it's always, but and you may do that for them to do it for themselves. Yes. 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 I think it's, I'd like to see it explained <coughs> as something you do together. Because otherwise, it's just—it's not just questioning. But off, I did do it through questions. But it's really a way of having the child think about the things you want to think about. Yeah. So, oops, sorry. Um, you will all be in a position of teaching young learners, and for many of them, of course, English will be a new language or at least the language that they're not completely comfortable with. So I'm going to talk about some of the practices that I think are important, and they're all informed by this notion of, of scaffolding. So there are four, area, four areas that I think we need to think about, or teachers need to think about, when they're working with children who are learning language. First of all, I think we need to integrate language with all subject content. So you're, you're all science and maths teachers, right? So you need to think about the way we use language in maths and science. It's not just the job of the language teacher. I'm going to give you examples of each of these, by the way. I'm just showing you where we're going um, before I get there. I think we need a very strong focus on with spoken language, and I'm talking, I'll talk a bit about that as well. I think we need a very conscious effort to make our own language comprehensible. One way of making language comprehensible is to make it simpler, but that's a short term solution because if you only use simple language with your students, then they will only learn simple language, and that's not enough. So I'm going to talk about ways that we can make language comprehensible so your students can understand you when you're using English. I would like to talk about teaching subject literacy, but I won't have time because that's a long... Well, I put it up there, but I'm not going to be talking about it because there isn't time to get into reading and writing, okay? But that would be the other thing I would, I would um, support. So let's look at the first one, integration of language and subject content. Um, I'm going to show you um, a real classroom, um, what happened in that classroom uh, in science. The students were following um, a program. One of the things they, ha they had to do was to think about um, magnets, okay? And the idea of what, how magnets worked. Um, and so the whole unit of work was around magnets. The first thing they did was to work out what was magnetic and what was not magnetic. Um, but I'm going to talk about that program in some detail and show you how the teachers, excuse me, how, how, how the teachers worked with language and science simultaneously. It's fairly usual in Australia now, in schools, for teachers to have objectives in a content area, but also to think about language objectives. One of the reasons that Australia started looking at language so seriously is that we have a very large number of children in schools whose home background uh, is a language that is not English. So where I live in Sydney, about half the population would speak another language other than English at home. Some of, I mean, a lot of them also speak English, um, but it's not the first language of many of the children. So although they do learn English because they're in an English-speaking environment, we have to pay more attention to English than you would if all the children already spoke English. And we also have large numbers of migrants as well um, and refugee students. Um, so we really need to think in terms of language in every curriculum area. 
So I designed this for language teachers and science teachers in this case to work together, to work collaboratively. So one of the objectives was for students to conduct group experiments to demonstrate the properties of magnets. So each group did a different experiment, but all of the experiments illustrated the properties of magnets. Perhaps they wanted the students to understand that objects are either magnetic or non-magnetic, and they wanted to, the students to name the properties of magnets using science language, science concepts. Oh, I forgot to tell you this was year three, which means that the children were about seven years old. Okay, so it's their third year of school. Fourth year, actually. Um, and then, having decided what the science activities were going to be, or the science knowledge was going to be, they then looked at the language. So the language objectives were, first of all, of course, some of the vocabulary. Magnetic, non-magnetic, repel, attract, north pole, south pole. That was the main vocabulary that they wanted students to learn. Of course they were going to learn other things as well, but you could, if you put too much here, you can't do it. So you've really got to select which is the most important part of the language. And of course the, the um, vocabulary in this case is very important. I'm not a fan, I don't like pre-teaching vocabulary. I don't like that. Because in order to teach this, you'd have to do the science, right? So I think it's better to have vocabulary embedded within the science and introduce those terms as, they, as is appropriate. One thing I do like, though, is for the students, perhaps on the board somewhere, to see these words written up. And the teacher can say, these are the words you are going to understand when we do this unit of work, but we're not going to define them now. So you've got the list of words in front of the students and they will recognize them when it's appropriate, when it's contextualized. Should the language explain to others what they did in their experiment using the past tense? So the past tense was another issue that they wanted to support the students. And make generalizations about the properties of magnets. So we use the present tense to do that. Magnets attract some metals. So fairly limited objectives. Don't try and put too much here, in here, because you end up doing none of it. It's better to be very, very selective. OK, so that's what I mean by integration. Um, the second one, if you remember, was how to plan for spoken language. So I'm going to show you now some transcripts of what the children actually said, because we had permission to record the students. So we wanted to listen to what the students were saying. So you'll see a transcription of what the students said. Now, first of all, I want to tell you uh, what, the, what one of the experiments actually was. I have to explain this. I, uh, I, actually, had, I actually had this experiment um, at home. I had, I had, I'll tell you what it is in a moment. And uh, I tried to take it on a plane because I was doing some work um, in uh, Vietnam. And uh, I wasn't allowed to take the magnets on the plane. I don't know what they thought I was going to do with them, but anyway. So I haven't got the actual experiment, but I have got a picture. So this is a polystyrene block. Is that the same word in Arabic, polystyrene? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, like the, you know, um, this. Oh, thank you. Polystyrene cup. That's polystyrene. Okay. So it was a square of polystyrene. Okay. I don't know what these are either, but you know the sticks that you put ice creams on? Yeah. Kind of pop sticks, we call them in Australia. So that's what they are, the wooden sticks. And they made, they had to make uh, a rectangle with these sticks stuck into the polystyrene block so that it would 
exactly fit the same size as a bar magnet. These are bar magnets, okay? Just stop me if I say something and you're not sure what the word is. Now the idea is that you put, the children have to put one magnet inside that little fence, and with the other magnet, it didn't matter which way around they put it, but they had to find out how it was different if you put it one way versus the other. Okay, so if you had the magnets in this position, uh, north and north and south and south, what's going to happen? Uh, I don't know the word. <laughs> well, that's right. And the thing is, if, you put, if this one's um, held in place with the power pop sticks, and you put the bar magnet on top, it can't go anywhere. So it looks like it's floating. It's a fabulous experiment. So it looks like it's floating, well it is floating, sort of like two inches above the, above the magnet. So it's just not, it's, it's suspended in midair. And if you put it the other way, of course they stick together. So this was to introduce students to the notion of, attract, of being attracting and repelling. And this what's, what's the purpose of the sticks? And Sorry? What's the purpose of these? Uh... Oh, because if you didn't have these, and you put the magnet here, um, uh, it would, it, and it was repelling it, it would just move this way. Mm. But because they've got the paddle pop sticks, it moves this way, and it looks unreal, because it's floating in the air without anything holding it up. And each group of students did a different experiment. And the reason for doing that, which also showed attraction and repulsion, the reason they were doing different ones was because to, the next thing they did was to explain to other people what they did. That was to practice using the language of science. But anyway, I'll show you first of all what the students said as they were doing this. They were playing with it. Try the other way like that, North Pole facing down. We tried that, oh, and they've just put it the other way so that it's floating. It stays up, magic. Let's show the others, mad. I put North Pole facing North Pole, see what happened. That's what we just did. Yeah, like this, look. So they played around with this, it's a really neat experiment. It's a fabulous one to do with young children because it really looks like something impossible is happening. Um, now the teacher left them for about 10 minutes because she said, find out what happens and think about how you would tell somebody else. So they had to think about how they were going to say this to somebody who hadn't seen it. So they carried on talking. Can I try that? I know, I know why that's like because the North Pole is on this side and that North Pole's there, so they don't stick together. Notice they're not using science language yet. What, like this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, see, because the North Pole is on this side, but turn it on the other side, this side like that. Turn it that way and it will stick. Now, after the students had all done their experiments, the teacher brought them all together and at this point, she starts to introduce the scientific vocabulary. Which is what I mean, it's embedded in the lesson. So she says to everybody, what are the, some of the words we're going to use? So the children said magnet, they knew that word. Attract, they knew that word. North Pole, South Pole. Now, I'm going to give you another word for what Joseph was trying to say. One more scientific word, and that is when something doesn't attract. Some of you were saying it pushes away or slips off. So instead of saying the magnet pushes away, I'm going to give you a new word, repel. It actually means push away from you, so she's demonstrating. So we're going to use, and then the, again the student suggested some of the key words. So this notion of repel was introduced in the context of needing the word because they couldn't explain it otherwise. And what I'm going to show you now is um, the conversation between the teacher and one of the students from that group who's going to explain what they did. 
to the rest of the class. Okay? So one of those group, one of those children, it was Hannah, was going to explain what she did because the other children hadn't seen this experiment. They'd all done another experiment. And you'll notice that although she seemed very fluent in that green in that group work, she was very probably the main leader in that group work. When she comes to tell the rest of the class, she finds it much more difficult. Because if you're talking about something while you're doing it, you don't need to be very precise. You can just say this and that and these. But when you're telling someone else what you did and you haven't got the, you haven't got the uh, experiment in front of you, it's a lot harder. So listen to what she says. <coughs> Try to tell them what you learned. Okay? Yes? I learned that um, when you put a magnet, the dots are one second pause. Each dot is one second. When you put a magnet, um, when, you put, when you put a magnet on top of a magnet, and the north pole poles are, and there's a seven second pause. It's a long time. Most teachers wait about one or two seconds only. Seven seconds is a long time, but look what happens. Yes, yes, you're doing fine. You put one magnet on top of another, so there's a little bit of scaffolding here. And the north poles are together. Um, the magnets repel the magnet. Um, the magnet and the other magnet sort of floats in the air. Now listen now, Hannah, explain once more. All right, Hannah, excuse me, everybody, because the kids are talking. Listen again to her explanation. I'm sure it hasn't actually come up properly on the screen. The two North Poles are leaning together, um, and the magnet repels, sorry, I'm reading the wrong one, repels the magnet, oh, we've done that one, haven't we? The two North Poles are leaning together, and the magnet on the bottom is repelling the magnet on top, so that the magnet on the top is sort of floating in the air. So that these two magnets are repelling each other and look at the force of it. What do you notice? Why is this an I said it's a very unusual, very unusual interaction. Why? Because the child is using the correct concept. Sorry, can you say that again? The child is using the correct uh, vocab. Yes, scientific yes. Vocab. Why? How? You said yeah. she listed them at the beginning. Maybe yeah. that's why. Yes. Um, another reason I think is that um, if you get most teachers only allow a student one term, you know they have to they try to give them the answer straight away. <laughs> She's a very patient teacher, so she allows the student not one, not two, but three times. And what happens? What's the difference between the first and the third? Was not clear. The first one's not clear. No, you don't have any idea really what she's talking about. But the last one. She has a full idea. She gives her time to think. Sorry. The whole idea of what she did is all in one. Yes, that's right. It's more fluent. Fewer, fewer pauses. She encouraged her on him to talk. And then she gave him more encouragement when she said, yes, yes, I know that, you know. And then she fixed her phrase by the scientific uh, yeah. words. So this yeah. will give her more to, to start doing more and more and explain more and more. Yes, yes. I think it's having high expectations of the student. Yes, you can do this. And a little bit of scaffolding. You put one magnet on top of another. It is very unusual. This is a very unusual text. I haven't. I found a few like this in primary schools, but very few indeed in secondary schools. Classroom talk gets faster and faster as you go through school. Um, so you can see the effect of not scaffolding too quickly, not scaffolding too quickly, but just to provide encouragement. Yes, yes, you're doing fine. And a little bit, we call that recasting when you take the student's words and you say it more correctly or more appropriately. It's called recasting. So you just recast it. You put one magnet on top of another. 
Um, and then really she doesn't say anything, she doesn't give any more help. But the student has had time to think. And if you're, as you would know very well, if you're listening to something in a language that's not your first language, you need longer to process. You need time to think about what someone said, um, if you're not fluent. Okay, so that's an example then of the role of, of, of talk. It, clarify, it helps the student to clarify their own thinking. But this is also, the last attempt, is also more like written language. It's not written language, but it's more like written language. I'm going to show you what Hannah wrote um, and how this talk actually helped her to write. She even drew a picture. She had to ask for the spelling of some words, but she wrote this by herself. I learned that a magnet had a north, a north pole and a south pole. Oh, sorry, the, what, the question from the teacher was, write down what you learned for all the children. I found it interesting that opposite sides like to attract. I found it very interesting that when you stuck at least eight paddle pop sticks in the shape of oval in a piece of polystyrene and then put a magnet with the north and south pole in the oval and put another magnet with the north and south pole on top, the magnet on the bottom will repel the magnet on top and the magnet on top will look like it is floating in the air. Now if you compare this, this language here, we go back to what she says there, it's almost the same, it's almost the same. So you can say, you can see how talk and time for talk, particularly with the teacher, is a good way to prepare students for writing. If you can say it clearly to someone else, you're more likely to be able to write it. If the student, if the teacher up here, after Hannah says that, just imagine if the teacher didn't do this and she just did that, Hannah would not have had any practice in producing language that was really very clear. So she wouldn't have had practice, um, and I don't think she would have written this. Now we don't need to talk like that all the time, of course, but we need to give students practice in using language before they write it. Talking together, talking with you, but they need to, they need practice in getting their ideas together in a way that's not, not rushed. One thing you can do for students is to say, you know, to ask a question for all the students, wait longer before you give them the answer, give them some thinking time, or you can say things like, turn to your partner and say what you think the answer is. So they think about it first together and then they give you an answer. Or maybe you can say, I'm going to ask you a question and I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think about it to everybody. You count up to 30 in your head. So they need wait time. Wait time is very, very important for all learners, even those learning in their first language. But it's particularly important if you're learning in a second language. Um, when I um, looked, I looked at the writing of all the children in the class, and it was interesting that many of them had written something a little bit like this, even though that wasn't their experiment. And so they, even listening helped them to produce writing. Anybody want to ask any questions? What time do I, am I finishing? Yeah, around three, so around about three. ten minutes. Okay. to show you how talk leads on to other kinds of, of thinking and writing. So that was, the, that was the text I started with, if you remember. That was another child who was talking about her own uh, experiment. We tried, they were finding out what was 
magnetic and what was not magnetic. So we tried a pin, a pencil sharpener, some iron filings, and a piece of plastic. The magnet didn't attract the pin, but it did attract the pencil sharpener and the iron filings. What I'm going to show you is how spoken language and written language come together. It's a continuum. So this is what one of the children wrote. Our experiment was to find out what a magnet attracted. We discovered that a magnet attracts some kinds of metal. It attracted the iron filings, but not the pin. It also did not attract things that were not metal. That was a different experiment from the one I, I've been telling you about. So here is a text from a, a school textbook in secondary school. Okay, so I'm jumping now. I'll just let you read that. The next one um, I got from my son. My son is a science teacher. I don't understand the next one. It's from a university level. Now I'm showing you this because I want you to think of language as not being speaking, writing. It's a continuum. It flows. And so all of these are if you like, in a, in a, in a line. So spoke, there's two kinds of spoken language. There's well, more than that, actually. But there's the kind of spoken language like text one, which you use when you can all see what each other's doing. So you don't need much vocabulary for that. It's a good, start, good starting point, like the experiment. The second one, though, is when you're telling someone else what you've learned or what you've done. And that's much harder. And I call it literate spoken language because it's a little bit more like writing. But that kind of language is a very good way in to talk about writing. Now sometimes teachers do something like text one, so the kids are all busy doing something, that's fine. And then they say to the children, now we're going to write about it. So they go from text one to something like this. And you can see the language is very, very different, very different. So I'm suggesting that you put in something like text two, where before you, after you've done something, before you write, you talk about it with someone, because that means that you're producing language that is more complex. Okay? So it's called the talking, I, I, it's a continuum. Think about spoken and written language as a continuum. But spoken language is a really important uh, tool as a way in to writing. Um, one of the challenges that we face, especially with the early language learners, but the lower level students, yes. is that they have the difficulty of the spoken language to text. So what we try to do is we try to pro you know, provide a medium for them where they can actually record what they're saying and then use it as a transcript. Because oftentimes what happens is that they see the piece of paper and they just freeze. Yeah. 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 So that creates a little bit of a bridge. You've already told me what you've said. Yeah. And I understand it and you understand it. Yeah. So at least it's a pre-recording of what they've already said and then just need to transcribe it. Can they understand it though when the things are not in front of them? Like if you recorded this when they were talking and doing, you get language like that. Well, I guess it's it, that's where the memory yeah. kind of jogs yeah. in as well. Yeah. So, and then if you want to even add a further way to scaffold, is by providing you know pictures. Sure. You know, and, and I know Sarah. That's can, a really good idea. I like the idea of recording. Well, that's definitely you know I know Sarah. Um, you definitely do that for your classes too. Mm -hmm. She provides some like PowerPoint. Yeah, I'm sure she can. I think just I have the visual. Some of them sometimes just need a picture, and then it sparks yes. something yes. completely other. Yes. Because the visual yes. learners, yeah, too, they need to remember what they did. Yeah. You know. So instead of having them do it like this teacher did, you're, you've got other ways of doing that. But but you're still providing that bridge yeah. between the media, spoken language, and the writing. That's and that's what's often missing. And to, and to have to go have students go straight from text one. It's too difficult, especially with the younger ones. Mm -hmm. 
But sometimes it's hard to get them it. into text too because when they're excited about it, they'll instantly go back into their comfortable language when they're talking themselves. If you get themselves. that group so you have to, to make talk sure to another them. group that's done something different. Yeah, but they're excited, so they'll start speaking in Arabic again. Oh, okay. And you have to say, no, 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 like, go back to, you know, like they yeah. get excited, yeah. so you have to help scaffold even that. I, I think if you've got two languages in the classroom, yeah. I think you, you should yeah. use them. They're yeah, a resource. Yeah, but it's so like if you want to study Arabic yeah. first, fine. Yeah, you know, and then uh, explain it a little more. Yeah. It's interesting to watch how the languages will. Yeah, so they're out. using Arabic to think with, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. why not? It's and then writing with the English. And um, these children all had different languages, so they couldn't do that. They couldn't remember. We had like 15 languages in the classroom. Yeah. So. But still, at the end, uh, they may explain orally better than the writing. Yes. Uh, and they start to write the ideas lost. Yeah. I think you'll find if they say some keywords. Um, but yes. she she remembered almost word for word those those. Yeah, of course, but not not all the children would would do the same. I mean, no. they can organize their ideas and write. They can say it already much better. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It depends on their skill. It does. It does. But I, I guess what I'm suggesting is that you need something between the language of yeah, doing it and this. But um, many teachers don't do that. They think because the children have the experience that they can then write about it. And it's, some children can, um, but others can't. And personally, I like to talk about things before I write them. Like when I'm writing books, I talk about the ideas I've got with other people, and it helps to clarify what I think. You know, so I, I think we, we must take spoken language seriously in the classroom. And generally, people like you, because you're teaching younger children, take, la take spoken language very seriously. Um, I, I expect it's the same here, but certainly in Australia, there's a lot of spoken language goes on in the lower years. But by the time you get into secondary, there's a lot less, because the teachers have so much curriculum content to, to get through. So we know that using spoken language helps students to learn, to learn about science in this example. It helps them to write if they talk about what they did with other people. And we also know from the work of people like Meryl Swain that spoken language is a very good context for second language development. Now just in the couple of minutes I've got left, I just want to uh, say something about um, making your language as the teacher accessible to students, making it comprehensible. And so this is about teacher language. When you're talking to a group of children, you're actually doing some direct teaching. How do you make your language accessible? I'm going to tell you a little story. This is a metaphor. Uh, it's a GPS system. It's a very old one, actually. It's my old one. I have to tell you that, I was talking to Anna earlier, I have no sense of direction. I get lost everywhere. And if you say to me, oh, you can find the room, it's straight down there, to the left, you go along the corridor, you turn to the right, and it's opposite you. I can't, I can't think that way. I don't, I have a very poor sense of direction. You have to see, Pardon? you have to see map or at least many other things as well. Even then, if I get there, I can't get back again. So, so but I'm using this as a, as a metaphor. Because when I started using uh, a GPS, which is many years ago now, um, it thought, I thought this is, a, this is what good classroom language is like. So let's look at what the GPS does. First of all, the spoken instructions are given in small bits of information and they're repeated several times. So for example, when I was driving home one day, I listened to what it said and it said left hand turn coming up. Turn left in 600 meters. So we go along the turn left in 500 meters, turn left in 400 meters until they reach the road I live in, which is called Epping Road. Then the voice says something like, turn left, Epping Road. Turn left now. Okay, so if I had not understood all of that, um, I ha it was repeated many, many times. So that helped. 
And it also, GPSs don't get cross with you when you get lost. You know, it just finds another way for you to, to move. But it didn't just do that. Accompanying the spoken language and representing the same information, there's a map on the screen that moves in time with the progress of the car, so there's a map. The visual representation matches the oral instructions, and to make the route clearer, it's indicated in, in color. So I can actually see where I'm going on the road. I can see it. So I'm listening, and I can see something. The third thing it, I think I like it for is because at the bottom of the screen, there's a, a visual, uh, there's another representation of the information. And there are symbols and numbers. There's an arrow, in this case pointing left, along with numbers that match the countdown of the spoken instructions. So I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. It's all the same information. And the landmarks are indicated, so I know where I am. You know, oh, there's the river, there's the bridge, there's the petrol station. Now this I call message abundancy. It means giving, I made that up, by the way, you won't find it in many books, message abundancy. Meaning that the same information is, got, is given in more than one way. So if you miss, if I don't understand this, I've got this. If I don't understand that, I've got this. And so it helps you to, to give, not to simplify the information. Don't simplify language too much, because if you do, the students will only learn simplified language. But make it comprehensible by presenting the same information in a lot of different modes. Now let me look at the classroom, and then I will have to stop. But this was an example of a primary classroom with very young learners. They were seven, six, about six or seven years old. Um, oh, I'll tell you about it first. The teacher was talking to them about the planets. And she was also showing them that the Earth turns. So they had a, a physical globe, and she was showing them how the earth turns. That was in the first lesson. This is the second lesson, and she's introducing them to um, the notion of um, rotate rather than, rather than turn. So this is what she says. It's a very good example of making language comprehensible, but not simplifying it. It's quite right what you all said, the earth turns. And she writes, the earth turns in blue on the board. But then there is another word that we can use, a special word that scientists use, a scientific word. So we can say the earth rotates. And all the children are saying rotates, rotates. It turns, it rotates. Look, so she's demonstrating, showing them how the earth turns with the globe. So what's it doing? It's rotating, it's turning. So the Earth rotates. Let's write that up too, besides what you told me before. So she then writes the Earth rotates, but she does that in red marker. And so if, if the students had difficulty in understanding her, they've got lots of other ways of seeing what she's talking about. She's demonstrating, she's giving them a very easy word like turn, together with the more complex word rotates, and she's color coding it, she's making it different colors. So she's using them together, but she's showing them that they're different. Now that's a really good example of how you can make a difficult word comprehensible to students. And these will be very young students. Teachers do this kind of thing all the time. It's not that unusual. But I think we need to think about how do you make complex ideas comprehensible. You don't necessarily have to just use an easier word. In fact, if you keep doing that, that's counterproductive. So this is just an example of message abundancy, and it's to do with teacher talk. Um, so I 
don't have time for any more. Thank you very much for listening. I hope it's been interesting for you. I just end with this with this uh, point. The teaching of subject language needs to occur in all content teaching, not only in language classes, you know that, and be integrated with subject learning across the curriculum. I'm sorry I haven't been able to talk about reading and writing, but there wasn't time. So I focused on spoken language, because particularly with young children, that's such an important part of their learning. So thank you very much. Thank you.